All right, so let's uh, your piece in uh, the American Prospect. Um, as we as we speak, uh, I've mentioned uh, that um, there's about fifteen thousand people protesting outside of the state house in Lansing, Michigan, uh, for a vote yep. that uh, seems to be more or less a foregone conclusion. It's not clear whether or not uh, Governor Snyder will actually sign this, but he's given all indications uh, that he will. Um, so let's, I mean, just w- let's start with uh, the premise of your piece. Uh, well, le- actually, let's start with what is a so-called right-to-work state? Okay. Um, Right to work as a state-by-state concept came into effect via the passage of the 1947 Taft-Hartley Act, which is probably one of the five or six most important domestic policy uh, pieces of legislation of the 20th century, right behind Medicare and Social Security and and Obamacare and and maybe a few others. Basically, what, what, what right to work did, Section 14B of the bill, is to permit states to, to, in effect, not in effect, but, but allow workers not to join a union as a condition of, of employment. But not only that, not only not to join the union, but also not to pay the union what's called an agency fee, uh, which compensates the union for representing the worker, because the worker will still gain from the benefits of a union-negotiated collective bargaining agreement, even if they're not in the union. Right, and we're not talking about tangential benefits that because uh, one union shop raises the wages for workers there, that other non-union shops uh, will feel an upward pressure on, uh, on, on wages. But literally, those people who are working alongside uh, union members who are paying dues, uh, the negotiations and uh, the concessions that uh, the unions get from the uh, from management are uh, are benefits that everyone shares in. Correct. I mean, it's it's a direct benefit. Basically, the right the 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 man or woman next to you is is paying union dues uh, and 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 get and prov- and getting a service for that. Uh, and you're not paying union union dues, but you're getting the the same services, whether it's increased safety and health. Uh, regulations, which might prevent you from losing a limb, or increased wages, increased uh, health care benefits, et cetera, et cetera. Before 1947, the entire country, based upon uh, the National Labor Relations Act of 1935, had, had what's called closed shop, where basically you, you join the union as a condition of employment, just as you, if your employer hires you for a first shift that starts 8 to 4, you, you uh, as a condition of employment, you have to show up at 8 o'clock, not at noon or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Same thing. But that was made a state-by-state uh, a prerogative uh, after the Taft-Hartley Act of 47. And, and not to put too fine a point on it, um, the, you, you've just sort of outlined uh, an, an important dynamic there because uh, we are sold this notion of uh, the so-called right-to-work um, uh, 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 laws as being, you know, enhancing worker freedom, uh, but it only comes at the expense of workers in general, as opposed to, you know, the idea of, well, let's expand worker freedom to where they can set their own hours. Uh, you know, that, that in other words, it, it just it wade into this a little bit, because I think this is very important for people to understand, because I think it's one of the biggest misconceptions and the most sort of arbitrary arguments of the, uh, of the libertarian ilk of, uh, of the conservative mind, if you will. Right. This, this yeah, uh, this is essentially uh, a crock, and it, it's a crock that's, that's, that's the probably mixed metaphors hidden behind a, right, a very high-minded uh, argument about economic freedom that, the liber- that libertarians make. You'll find this on the National Right to Work Foundation uh, which is dedicated to this issue and actually provides a lot of very useful, objective, factual information about court decisions and about the rights that workers do have, depending on what state they're in, et cetera, et cetera. But basically the claim is that, well, this takes away a worker's freedom because, you know, you're, 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 you're Joe or Josephine Worker, you show up to work, and then some, suddenly this, this, this union official's in your face saying, hey, you got to join the union. Well, right. There's all kinds of things that you have to do at work. 
that, that's why all of us, every employee in the country, uh, gets some sort of like worker employer handbook, which explains to them what their employer wants from them and what they expect from them and the things they can do and, and the things they can't do. Um, employers are not allowed to discriminate based on the essence of who you are, meaning whether you are uh, of a race they don't like or a, a gender they don't like. Um, but they are, they are allowed. It's the basic of, of pretty much uh, you know, Anglo-American law going back a long way to set the terms and conditions of their employment. This is just another term and condition of employment. The difference is it's an agreement that's been made between a union and the employer uh, to set that term and condition. It's not exclusively a term and condition set by the employer uh, itself. And, and, and the, that's, that's the fear that these libertarians have, that the, right. and that the, the union will gain more power. And the, next, and the next step of that argument is, of course, well, of course, the, um, the management can set uh, certain conditions because they're the ones who are paying the workers. Uh, but, you know, the workers are getting uh, benefit from the context of, uh, of unions negotiating, so the, the, the net is exactly. obviously greater. Uh, exactly. So Exa- the, exactly. And what, and what right to work does, which, in fact, is the difference between a right-to-work state and a non-right-to-work state, is, you know, it, it, it doesn't even permit the worker to say, you know, I don't like the, the union's politics. You know, they, they're always supporting Democrats or whatever. You know, I'm not going to support that. But, okay, uh, I get it. I have to pay some fee to compensate the union for representing me uh, uh, and, and, and gaining me benefits via collective bargaining agreement. Right to work, as it will be played out in Michigan, if this is finally implemented, and in the other 23 states where it is, says, you don't pay the union anything, uh, but the union still represents you. So, yeah, right, it is what's called uh, the free rider problem. Right. And so it's not, I mean, uh, we, people should be clear here that this is not just simply saying you don't have to join the union. It means that you don't even have to pay a lesser fee in terms of uh, compensating the union for the work they're doing on your behalf in which you are gladly accepting. I mean, you know, right. uh, you're not going to see a worker say, uh, now that I, um, uh, you know, now that I, uh, this is a right to work, I don't have to pay that fee. I'm not going to take the benefits that the union has negotiated on my behalf. I'm going to take right. uh, 10, 15 percent less in pay. I'm going to have a, uh, a crappier pension or no pension. I'm right. going to work on the most dangerous machines that exist on the, on the floor uh, exactly. that, that uh, you know, aren't inspected on a regular basis, et cetera, et cetera. Th- right. if, if this was going to be, if we were really going to um, uh, play by those rules, you would have to see those workers give back those <laughs> uh, right. concessions. Exactly. And that's in fact, and in fact, in Michigan, uh, at, at, this ver- at this moment, although that may change by the end of the day, uh, and, and in the other uh, non-right-to-work states, in fact, you already have that right. You simply have to pay, again, what's called this agency fee, which, which will be less by definition than what you would pay in union dues, because, right, you're not also uh, paying what would go into, you know, uh, sustaining the union's political program or a community outreach program or anything else that the union does with its revenue base and, and, and its budget. You're only paying for your collective, collective bargaining benefits, in effect. And so, um, and we know there has been, I mean, it's it's a very difficult thing to measure, particularly at a time when we have such a low uh, rate of unionization in uh, amongst the private workers in this country. Right. Uh, right. Six point nine percent, which is, which is the lowest it's been since around nineteen hundred. Uh, so it's pretty stunning. Right, and it's not the lowest this... in the Western world. It's the lowest in the advanced world. Um, the French have a pretty low, low rate also. But it's important to know that even though the French have a, a low rate, the unions do negotiate a collective bargaining agreements for almost ninety percent of French workers anyway. So. You know, they, they're, they're covered, and the unions still have a lot of power from that, but not here in the United States. And we also know from the limited data that's out there that uh, right-to-work um, uh, states tend to have lower wages. They also yeah. tend to have more worker injuries and worker deaths um, because there is uh, less protection for them. And so in, w- w- with, with all of that, um, why is what's happening in Michigan worse than what happened in Wisconsin? 
Well, I think a, cu- a couple of reasons. Um, one is that it, it covers the entire workforce. Um, uh, at this point in time in the United States, public sector workers are, as we were just implying, much more, much more potent a force and much larger a force than private sector workers. There are about 30, 35% of public sector workers are, are under union contract. Um, and that's who was covered in Wisconsin. There was no effort to, uh, to make uh, Wisconsin a right-to-work state for private sector workers. Uh, and, pri- and private sector workers, even in their currently atrophied condition as, as a potent la- uh, labor union force, are, are the thing which drives uh, economic changes for the workplace as a whole. When the UAW was uh, uh, at its peak in the 50s and 60s, it set like contract standards, wage and benefit standards uh, in the United Steelworkers for all kinds of non non union employers. I mean that that helped build the American middle class in those in those decades. So to target directly uh, private sector workers uh, beyond the public sector efforts in say Wisconsin or Ohio is a dramatically different thing, and it is especially a dramatically different thing. Uh, in, in, in the birthplace of the United Auto, Auto Workers, which really, really was the most important, powerful, and as Howard Morrison said in the American Prospect the other day, the best American union uh, of, of the 20th century. So there's a, there's a very evocative kind of symbolic power to, to this changing possibly changing in, in Michigan as well. Just, just give us a little history of the UAW's role, both in terms of empowering workers across the country, but also, and I think, um, you know, your piece um, uh, points this out, uh, the UAW also played a, a, a very strong uh, role in social change in this country. Oh, yeah, ab- absolutely. I mean, on, on, the, on, on the first issue of empowering workers, I mean, the UAW... Um, followed the growth of, of what was called by some the Fordist economy, as in Ford Motor Company, but it also meant all the other automobile, great automobile companies. The, the, the manufacturing uh, uh, spearhead of the, of the entire U.S. economy, as those, as those companies grew, uh, workers felt empowered, and through very bloody, brutal, tough, militant action, as militant and tough as, again, any in the advanced Western world, um, they organized those companies uh, in the mid-30s. When they organized those companies, that organization, again, also, also spread to, to steel, to rubber, to, to, uh, to electric companies, to the entire manufacturing base, and produced that great economic change that I just alluded to earlier. But the UAW was more than just like a me-first labor union. It, it saw itself, especially uh, through the eyes of its um, really remarkable uh, president, Walter Ruther, as, as, a, as an institution to advance social justice uh, in the United States more generally. Ruther was militantly anti-racist, fought racism in his own, in his own union, uh, was, was a strong supporter of the civil rights movement at a time when other unions, frankly, were not. Um, was worked worked uh, directly and closely with Dr. King. Stood behind him. Uh, you can see in in the in the grainy photos and 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 uh, video of Dr. King giving his uh, uh, "I Have a Dream" speech in August 1963 in Washington. You can see Ruther behind him. Uh, Ruther also, you know, adva- you know, underscored and helped uh, even the development of Students for a Democratic Society in the 1960s, like the the, the core organization of the New Left. I mean. It, the Port Huron statement, the founding document of that group, was written at a UAW-owned uh, campground in, in, in Michigan, and that wasn't just a coincidence. That's that's that wasn't just oh they're renting out the campground. That was like going to, to a progressive group by by the, the nascent SES forces who would who would support them. Um, Russo, toward the end of his life, he died in 1970, also finally came out against the Vietnam War. Which was, which was also a very important break within the labor movement and within the broad American liberal left, too. It's, he, he, he hesitated to do that, as, as did Dr. King, because they, they both worked closely with, with Lyndon Johnson and wanted to maintain a good working relationship with him. 
Um, but he did, he did that as well. Um, he even spoke out very early, like 69 maybe, maybe early 70 before he died, about, about environmentalism, uh, which is something that you didn't hear in manufacturing, uh, <laughs> manufacturing groups, unions, or employers talk about much then. So it's just an incredibly important organization, in, not just in the history of the American labor movement, in, in the history of 20th century America. You know, it's 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 especially interesting to me because I I wasn't really aware of uh, Ruther's uh, role and the UAW's role in that aspect of it because one of the things that um, people have been writing about over the past couple of years is the the cleave uh, that uh, developed between unions and the social liberal left uh, around mm-hmm. that time in the early seventies, which in some ways uh, began the created a sort of a um, uh, a cycle of weakening uh, the union support and strength in the Democratic Party and then the Democrats not um, uh, supporting unions. Uh, and it, it, it's, mm-hmm. you know, this idea that uh, in many respects that was the beginning of the end of union strength because um, unions became alienated from uh the, the 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 social left i guess uh in this country mm-hmm. yeah that you know that, that that's right um you know you had essentially a a split between on one hand the i mean is this is no other way to say it, the white working class and it and especially its institutions unions and this is at a time when unions had 30% density in the workforce in private sector in the private sector, as opposed to, as I said, like 7% now. So it really mattered. what <laughs> There was a real political, economic, and social weight to what unions thought. And like emerging, emerging new uh, uh, progressive formations of the 60s and early 70s, feminism, uh, the gay rights movement, um, to some extent the, African, the African-American movement and the civil rights movement. Um, now, but within that sort of broadly labor anxiety, I think, because a lot of this is, is a kind of social, social cultural anxiety toward these emerging groups that a lot of Americans share, and of course we know to this day a lot of Americans share, there was a split within labor. Um, there were more um, uh, progressive unions that were sympathetic to these groups. Part of it had to do with like their own membership. Their own membership might have been more female or African-American, like the, like the public sector unions, like AFSCME. And Ruther, even though there were a lot of, you know, white guys in the auto workers, there were also a lot of African-American guys in the auto workers. And, and Ruther sort of, you know, caught that, and he always thought this. He thought this in the 40s when he became president of the UAW. You know, he, he thought that the UAW should be, broadly speaking, an, an organization that, that defends sort of social justice. Um, so there was a conflict between a, a few of the unions, on one hand, who, who, who supported these emergent uh, social movements of the 60s and early, early 70s, uh, and others, like some of the building trades unions, um, you know, parts of like the overall umbrella group, the AFL-CIO, and George Meany, you know, famously said something like, you know, the anti-war demonstrators, like, you know, meaning the male anti-war demonstrators, you know, look, look, look these, these are jacks who, who look like Jills and smell like Johns, right. was Meany's remark in like, you know, 1969 or 70. So th- there was a split, but there was also like a pushback against that split within labor. And that, you know, that should be, should be recognized and understood as well. Assuming uh, that the um, that we, we see this implemented in Michigan, uh, the, the the implications are going to be. I mean, there, there there's a, obviously aside from just the implications in Michigan. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about the where you see the the unions um, going where, where in the future. But before we get there, what are the uh, you know you quoted uh, Iglesias uh, Matt Iglesias in your piece about the sort of the 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 truce more or less between uh, right to work states, so called right to work states, and states that uh, allowed essentially unions to have 
um, some measure of parity in uh, in entering a contract uh, with with management. <clears throat> um, is that where what happens now politically? I mean, uh, we, we saw some uh, Michigan, uh, the I guess uh, members of the uh, House delegation uh, meeting with Snyder, saying like, "Don't do this. Uh, this is going to be." Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. But where where is there really anywhere to go now? I mean, because it seems to me that, and I think that well, this is a big point of your your piece that uh, if it can happen in Michigan. It's very difficult for it to happen anywhere, and 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 maybe we need to talk before we get there about the um, the referendum that lost this past uh, November sixth, uh, because the union smelt this coming down the pike, saw this coming down the pike. It's right. my mixed metaphor, I guess. No, that's right, um, and I, and I think that the Michigan situation may be a case of, of I mean, it's a cliche, but nevertheless, maybe a case of both sides over overreaching. First, the unions, and now. The, uh, the 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 corporate leadership the, uh, in in Michigan and their and their political their political and ideological allies. Um, Michigan is is not Indiana. It should be noted that Indiana actually changed its right to work laws uh, at the beginning of the year 2012. But the, the the union density in 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 Indiana is you know maybe half slightly more than half what it is in 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 Michigan. Uh, it frankly it was just easier to roll the unions there. That was the first new right to work state, and and, and you know a, a fair, a, a, you know quite quite a while I think. I mean that sort of began to like sort of chip away at the you know this kind of status quo where there were right to work states and there were non right to work states. And we should now, say that there's a the, Michigan would be the 24th state I think in the country. Right, uh, right. The country is 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 roughly split uh, at least state wise. I think population wise. There are still many more people in non-right-to-work states. Um, however, uh, because uh, just to say, because the, it's the it's the the old Confederate South and the sort of you know fairly non uh, lesser populated sort of mountain states and plain states of, of the Midwest that that are are, are right to work. So so right. So M- Michigan Union saw what happened in Indiana. They were looking at Wisconsin and the fight in Ohio, and they said, well, let's get ahead of this. And run a referendum, which would enshrine collective bargaining in the Michigan State Constitution. And you know, sort of on the surface, that sounds like an appealing idea if you're if you're a labor strategist in Michigan and maybe around the country. But you have to remember, like when the UAW was at its peak, and Michigan probably had like forty percent or union density like fifty years ago, when Democratic presidents used to begin their their or Democratic candidates for president used to begin their campaigns by campaigning in Cadillac Square in Detroit with thousands of UAW members cheering for them, they didn't have to do the Constitution thing because that was a, it was a fact on the ground that the unions were powerful. So they tried to do this thing, but the paradox is that the very fact that they had to do it demonstrated that they were, they were too weak to pull it off. So the referendum, they, they run a you know, full campaign, 21 million bucks. They're outspent by a little bit, like $25 million for the corporate side, but not too much. Um, and they lose 58-42, like in a, in a presidential year when you're going to get a big Democratic turnout. So they run uh, 12 points behind Barack Obama uh, in, in, uh, for this, for this, collect, uh, for this uh, enshrining collective bargaining in, in, in the Constitution referendum. So that's when the right to work side says, you know, hey, that's an easy head count for us. I mean, they don't, they're not as, as powerful as they maybe wanted to think they were, now we can beat them. So let's beat them. On the other hand, to change the status quo and, and make a, a state as identified with collective bargaining and union rights as Michigan, a right-to-work state, even at a point when unions are much weaker than, than they used to be, is a dramatic switch. And, you know, mostly, you know, Americans are usually you know, unless things are very dramatic, frightened about change. Like even the big three auto companies don't want, don't want this to change. I mean, they have a, a working relationship with the UAW now, I and mean, it's not it's been, you know, bad for, for, for union members. I mean, they've lost a lot of wages and benefits, but the companies have survived, and they, and they, they don't want to sort of sh- shake this up. They don't, it's not in their benefit. Change they don't think is in their benefit. And I suspect a lot of Michigan voters don't, don't want to shake things up either. That, you know, like... 
They don't want massive demonstrations. They don't want some, some, somebody trying to figure out a way how to recall the Governor Snyder in that state. Um, you know, they, they basically don't want, I would suspect, the trauma of a reasonable amount of, of civic unrest. So I think, you know, I'm sort of, you know, moderately optimistic that one way or another, this, this, this doesn't happen long term. Either, either Snyder backs down, which I don't know if he'll do that. He has a lot of people pushing him to do it. Or if he does, if he does sign it, there is some kind of referendum. Apparently there's like something in the, in the state constitution that does allow a referendum, although it's, it's a tricky thing. It's kind of like a like a like a two ball off off the off the, the eight ball mm-hmm. to the four ball into the side pocket kind of thing. But they, they might be able to do that, or else, you know, it's only two years to the next gubernatorial election. They were you know Dems will run very hard to replace Snyder and to replace uh, different state legislators who voted for this. So I think they might be able to turn it around in Michigan. You know, so, beyond that, the the fate of the, the broader American labor movement. Um, that's more problematic. Well, well let's right talk now. about that briefly because you okay. mentioned you mentioned that um, in Nevada, the I think it's the Culinary um, Union, right? Um, culinary is, lo- lo- Local Union uh, two two six. They're working in the context of a uh, so called right to work state, and they have uh, had a tremendous amount of success because of the nature of the union, and 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 I want you to just sort of. Outline that. And also, one of the things that struck me this past year, we had the Chicago teacher strike, which mm-hmm. was in, which was incredibly effective. And one of the mm-hmm. things uh, that they the, the teachers were able to do, and I presume part of it is because they're teachers, uh, but they had the ability to communicate and they spent resources and time. And it, it sounds like a had a specific strategy uh, long before they went on strike to create relationships with the broader community so Mm -hmm. that the broader community... Now, of course, your teachers, you're you're talking to parents. It's almost sort of a, uh, you know, that's that's almost pre-existing in some respects. But they invested the broader community. They they both were... the, The teachers' union was not just working for the teachers. They made it clear to the broader community that the teachers' union was also working for the broader community. And that uh, mm-hmm. there are many people who argued in the wake of the failure to recall Scott Walker that what the unions might have been better off doing is making it clear to the broader community that, look, this is not just an attack on us. It's ultimately an attack on the broader community because this is going to uh, affect the services that you get. It's going to affect your wages. Um, w- you need to invest people outside of the union in the union struggle. Right. Right, that's right. And, you know, I, I agree with you that the teachers in Chicago were quite effective and that in general sort of there, that possibility opens up for members of what you might call like sort of caring professions. Right. Like teachers, like nurses, mm-hmm. like, you know, you know, like cops and firefighters who it should be uh, noted are excluded from this right to work law in, in Michigan because they often support Republicans, and it seems like that's a cutout designed to, you know, support groups that su- support uh, right-to-work type people. Um, and I, I do agree that, you know, it's very important these days for unions to to be, as, as Ruther wished and hoped, to be as community-minded, as, as broad in their, in their social appeal as, as possible. To not not be what they're often called uh, by conservatives and Republicans uh, special interest, quote unquote, to, 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 to be to be organizations that advance the, the general interest. Um, and, and culinary two two six in Las Vegas is a fascinating story because essentially you had a situation where you had a bunch of Las Vegas unions, the uh, a bunch of Las Vegas uh, casinos where you had unions that were somewhat corrupt, somewhat, you know, just going along with, with, with the corporations uh, who ran those casinos and, and the individuals who ran those casinos. And then you had a tremendous effort by, by the uh, hotel and restaurant workers union, the parent of culinary, to, to organize the entire town. And now almost every casino in that, in that uh, uh, 
city, and it's the fastest growing city in the United States, even allowing for the, how badly it was hit by the recession, is, is unionized, it's, except for Sheldon Adelson's mm. and, and one other. And those, those housekeepers there, they, they, in, in Las Vegas, you know, I mean, everybody got hit hard by the recession, by the housing uh, bubble uh, being exploded. But basically, they can live a middle-class life there. Um, and the union is incredibly militant, has a tremendous esprit de corps. If you go to Vegas sometimes, you'll see, you'll see workers in the casinos, just as they say in the labor movement, buttoned up, wearing like a culinary 226 button, just to show they support the union. I mean, there is not a big problem getting union dues from, from workers in, in, at Culinary 226. Uh, it's what, it's, it's uh, one of the most powerful institutions in the state. Uh, the just retired, uh, the just, uh, uh, well, he didn't retire, he moved on to be president of the parent union, uh, leader of the union. Dee Taylor was like in, a, in a, like Nevada magazine or something eight or ten years ago, rated the third most powerful person in the state. I mean, that union has juice, and it has juice in a right-to-work state because the, the workers feel that they own the union, the union empowers them, and they are, they are happy to, to support that union with their union dues because they know that union in turn has them, has their back. So it, it's, a, it's a fascinating story. It's a story that has a lot to do with how you – you know, the, the difficulties, but also the, the uh, successes of building social movements. Uh, uh, it's a big deal, that union in that state. But, you know, how do you sort of go from a, a state of, uh, you know, a million or two million people to a country of 310 million uh, and create that kind of energy for, for social change and, and, uh, uh, and within the labor movement? You know, obviously it's a much more challenging, complicated question to consider. Yeah, I was going to, I mean, uh, maybe it's an unfair question, but I mean, do you think that it's possible that we're going to see um, an evolution of unions to become, I mean, in some ways to, uh, you know, it's one of those sort of, it's almost sort of the same uh, dynamic of a, uh, of a of an insurance risk pool in, in a death spiral in some respects, that uh, you're, you're maintaining the last vestige of your power, uh, which is keeping you alive to a certain extent. Um, I mean, I think you even may have said in your piece, or I just read, the, they're taking a certain medicine, which is keeping them alive, but it's also making them weaker in some respects. And, and yeah, that's the, that's the trick with... Uh, with, with, with automatic union dues, it's it's you know it's actually a vexed question. On one hand, uh, you know this makes the, the functioning of a union, the the receiving of its revenue base uh, from from the workers, because that's how unions unions uh, obtain their money from from union dues, the way a government obtains money from taxes, uh, and that's how it funds itself. It makes it easy because the, it's automatically deducted from workers' paychecks uh, uh, under the auspices, actually, of the employer. Um, the trick is, and you use the, the term insurance, that's the, that is exactly the cusp of the issue. Uh, is a union an, essentially an insurance company where right, you send in a check or you have it automatically deducted from your bank account every month or every three months or, or yearly, and the, the insurance company provides you with, with, with a service? especially when you, particularly when you need it most badly, you know, you get money from the insurance company in turn when things aren't going well for you, your car gets totaled or whatever. So is the union that, or is the union actually a social movement, hmm. a, a, uh, an institution that advances social justice, as, as, as Ruther wished, and as Dr. King said too, you know, why well, I still remember Dr. King died in the middle, uh, was shot in the middle of a union struggle of uh, garbage workers in Memphis, Tennessee. He went there to support that. Um, that's the trick. If, you're, if, if it's an insurance company, then actually the, the easiest thing to do is to take the money out. Uh, and, in fact, unions, most unions need that today. Most unions aren't culinary 226 in Las Vegas. Um, the, the relationship between them and their workers is sometimes good, sometimes bad something in between, but they don't have like the, the sort of wherewithal, the logistical power to sort of go to each worker and sort of say, hey, you know, 
the union is a good thing. You you know you need to really chip in yourself to keep it going. Otherwise, it's going to fade away. You know, we can't keep providing right. services without you you giving us something. So is it is it an insurance company or is it a social justice movement? It's a social justice movement. You see, as in culinary two two six, people gladly give give the money. I mean, they they they're receiving benefits, yes, but they're receiving benefits because they feel that the union empowers them, and they, in turn, are the backbone of the union. Well, um, well, so it's Rich, a complicated issue. Yes, and I appreciate your uh, your talking to us about it. And it's uh, just been uh, reported that the the House, Michigan House, passed. The uh, the legislation fifty eight to fifty one, and now I guess it heads uh, to Governor Snyder's uh, desk, and we shall see. But uh, Rich, I really appreciate you taking the time.